Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Growing Social Now, brought to you by Corey West Media. I am your podcast host, Barbara Rosgoni, and today I am really excited to have as my special guest, Caleb Gardner. Welcome, Caleb. Thanks for having me. So fun to be here. Yeah, Caleb and I met each other on the board of Social Media Club Chicago years ago. I was trying to think, maybe it was 2010, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it would have been like 2011, maybe. Yeah, definitely yeah. a long time ago now. It, it, it was like in a whole nother, it seems like, who even knew that we would be talking about what we're talking about then? It's like yeah. in a whole new world. And so Caleb has a new book out. It's called No Point B. And right on the cover, a quote from Seth Godin, you might be wondering, should I read this? And Seth says, change isn't a threat, it's an opportunity. Caleb Gardner is here to help us see that better is possible. And I have to tell you, when I saw this, Caleb, I, first of all, I was super excited to read the book because having known you and been on the board with you and gone to so many events and just watched your career, I was like, what does Caleb have to say? So it's no point B, rules for leading change and the new hyper-connected, radically conscious economy. Wow. And so Caleb, <laughs> you and I were just talking and you said that in 20, when you first came up with this proposal, you were wondering if it would still be relevant. Tell us about that. Yeah, <laughs> we, we <laughs> sold it in 2020. We, we were developing the proposal, my agent and I. And, you know, it was really about the work that I'd been doing for the last five years at my firm, 18 Copies. And it was kind of summarizing that and the the transformation work we've been doing. And I was like, it's hyper relevant now that we've been in this global pandemic. You know, at that point, it was, we'd all been forced into remote work and, and you know, technology in the workplace was a big conversation. We had just had George Floyd. So like the yeah. intersection of business and politics, which is something that I've always been passionate about, was right on the tip of everyone's tongues. And we were, they were talking about how do we hold ourselves accountable to our um, inclusion goals and um, there was just, there was so much about the exact things that we care about as a firm, the exact things that I care about personally, that were, we were baking into the book that we were like, this is, this is amazing, but the book's going to take, you know, I have to actually sit down and write it and then it has to be published. So, you know, the turnaround time is two years minimum. And is it still going to be relevant when it comes out in 2022? Cause at the time, at the end of 2020, we were looking at the vaccine, we were like, mm -hmm. people were talking about the roaring 20s, you know, like we're going to come out of the pandemic and the economy is going to be great. And there's going to be all this pent up demand. Um, and so there's all this optimism that, you know, that we were going to things were going to get back to normal, quote unquote. And I think if anything, the last two years have proven that the kind of disruption we felt at the beginning of the pandemic can happen in big and small ways all the time with you know, global wars and, you know, uh, elections and all kinds of things mm -hmm. that, that, that disrupt our, our normal day to day to day life and the way that we do business. So it's been very, very uh, affirming that the book was still in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I would agree. And, and I told you, I, I, I read your book and I wrote down so many different things to remember, and I've got so many pages marked and your quotes are just really profound. So one of the things you say is, I believe the future of the internet is the future of humanity. And then you say, these aren't like right together, but another thing I like that you said is from now on, all leadership is change leadership. So could you talk a little bit about the future of humanity and change leadership? Yeah, I mean, I think what's been true for a long time is that leadership and transformation have been um, you know, part of the same conversation. Mm -hmm. And when I studied business many years ago, um, we talked about leaders being chaos creators. Like they're the ones who come in and shake mm -hmm. up the status quo, status quo and create the need for transformation, right? Like they see, they see opportunities in the market and they want to create an organization that can go after that. Or they see, you know, bureaucracy and things holding the organization's potential and they needed to change, they needed to go faster, they needed to be mm -hmm. more adaptive. And so leaders have always, to some extent, been change leaders. I think what's new in the moment that we are in is that the internet has seeped into every facet of our lives, to That's, my point about, you so know, true. Yeah. <laughs> more so even than when you and I were on social media club back in 2011 and, you know, evangelizing social. Now we're, 
now I'm, I feel like I'm doing the opposite where I'm like, okay, hold on. No, TikTok, please don't be this place where we get all our news. You know, I'm like, I, I know I saw down. you had a tweet about that and you're, you're right. I mean, TikTok is taking over Google as a search engine. Now. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. And, and like, <laughs> to some extent I'm always, I try not to ever be a curmudgeon and I want to like learn from why, mm-hmm. why is this happening? How are we, how, like, why are we so attracted to finding our answers on something like TikTok? And then the other, I'm like, oh my God, like there's so many national security issues around TikTok and also like mm-hmm. the TikTokification, if you call it that, of news really boils things down in unnuanced ways, just like Ooh. Instagram graphics did, right? Like it's yeah, it's great yeah. to be able to boil down issues, but also some things are really complicated and take take a lot of storytelling over time to really understand. Anyway, but to go back to <laughs> what talking about, change leadership. I mean, this is, that's a great example of it, right? Like we have mm-hmm. to, the internet itself is changing the way that we, we interact with the world and more so than business leaders realize change the way that we interact with our workplaces and with our employees. Mm-hmm. One, I mean, we are, we have now been forced into remote and hybrid work like never before in the last few weeks. What does it mean that we are now in isolation in work we don't have the same kind of social consequences we have for speaking out, which is a good and bad thing. Right. We have Twitter or TikTok, to your point, um, up at the same window as we have our Slack or our Teams or our like workplace mm-hmm. chats. You know, like it's it's all being integrated together. That's something that leaders have never really had to reconcile with. Like it's new ish, like in the past fifteen years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, especially in the past five, but definitely in the past uh, 15 as social has grown. Um, and then we've got, you know, all the kind of normal global catastrophes that get amplified to that. We've got, we're still dealing with the pandemic. We're still dealing mm-hmm. with war in Ukraine and inflation mm-hmm. and economic woes and all of those kind of things that di- that didn't feel as urgent as they used to because mm-hmm. we learned so much more about them now. We learn we are constantly processing all the ways the world is broken at once and and it's taxing our mental load in a way that we've never had to deal with before so it's we're <laughs> it's change leadership is both like something that we've always had mm-hmm. to develop and mm-hmm. something that is very unique to now and and needed you know in terms of a leadership development skill right now I, I would so agree. And you say digital natives are pushing society forward while, institu- while institutional dinosaurs are just catching up. So what advice would you give for people? Because I mean, this is like a whoosh effect. I mean, this yeah, is, right. I would say that, you know, I did a, uh, a panel for AMA Chicago on social media trends in February and just looking at everything that had happened because of the pandemic and things that were coming down the pike, it is mind blowing. Mm-hmm. So how can people get caught up in what's going on? What, how much do leaders need to know? I mean, should it all be in internal communications? And by the way, I love what you, you address so much about internal communications in your book. It's a, it's a must read for anyone who's involved in communications in corporate. A hundred percent. I think it's much yeah. more important than people give it credit for. Oh yeah. Um, what was the question that you asked me? For okay. The so the question, question was, what can the institutional dinosaurs yes, do that's right. so they can speed up? And like one of the examples you give is uh, Basecamp decided no one can talk about politics and a third yep. of the people resigned in one week. So that's yep. not the right move. <laughs> right. <laughs> what I mean, is the right move? <laughs> what, you know, I use the term institutional dinosaurs, not, not in, uh, as slanderous like i just think yeah. it's it's the world that we built right like everything mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. how our democracy works and it's meant to be bureaucratic and it's meant to be slow mm-hmm. to how our companies work we're meant to have oversight and governance and compromise and and so like i just i i think what's tough about the world we live in is there's an immediacy that we expect because of a lot of how we live our digital lives we can get information like that I, I tweeted the other day that I, I went to sleep thinking about, oh, I was supposed to buy something and like went to Amazon and bought it as I was going to sleep. And it was literally on my doorstep when I woke up the next morning. I was like, <laughs> like, that's the, wor- that's the world that's of the immediacy world we that blown. we live in, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So there's never going to be, like, we're never going to be able to fully reconcile running a, a company with appropriate oversight Mm-hmm. with the kind of immediacy that we live in. Like we're going to have to live in that kind of tension. So it becomes about reconciling why we're making the decisions we are, 
why we're compromising in certain areas or at least like punting in certain areas um, mm-hmm. with our everyone's expectations that we should be faster and smarter and more socially conscious and you know mm-hmm. with the kind of individualization of our our expectations and our values and actually this goes back to what we were just talking about internal comms because the only way to mm-hmm. do that is by managing expectations helping people understand why we're making the decisions we are like that's where internal comms becomes so important Mm -hmm. yeah and I like how you talked about the layering effect that you picked up from Barack Obama's campaign you know Mm -hmm. there's not just one way to communicate with people so I think you had something like emails texts and even like um, messaging on whiteboards or whatever but do you want to tell us a little bit about that I mean what are some tools for internal communications teams yeah, I mean, we used to call it the ladder of engagement. It was mm-hmm. the idea that you have to meet people where they are. Mm-hmm. If they care in the political environment, if they care about climate change and they sign up for your email list to hear about your what you're doing on climate change and you start immediately talking about the minimum wage or you know, a ho- whole host of other issues they didn't actually they aren't actually interested in, they're going to disengage. Mm-hmm. Like you start with the thing they actually care about and then you build a permission structure for engaging them on other things. Like you mm-hmm. care about this. Hey, can we actually get you over here to care about this? So okay. you, you expand their worldview and you also give them ways to go deeper. So you care about mm-hmm. climate change. Okay, great. Can we get you to give to this cause? Can we get mm-hmm. you to write to your senator? Can we get you to mm-hmm. show up to your senator's office? Like there's mm-hmm. there's also deeper ways we can engage you on the things you care about. So if we could think about how we persuade our employees with that kind of complexity and depth, I mean, imagine what we could do, but it does take some resources and it takes some time. Um, Seth Godin actually calls this permission marketing. Like he, he right. you know, talked about this decades mm-hmm. ago right. in terms of the best way to do marketing. Like the political environment, I think is just because of how fast paced it is and how much it turns over has really tried to perfect it. Mm-hmm. So, um, We've talked, uh, so permission marketing, that's what the internal side should do. But what do you do about those employees? I mean, it's kind of like, isn't it kind of, um, it's a fine line because we want to give employees freedom to, Mm -hmm. or maybe you don't, it depends on the company. I know I have friends who work for companies and they can't post anything. It's usually in financial services or law or something. Right, a little bit more regulatory environment, yeah. Which which I get, but um, how do we empower employees on social media without really losing, you know, the brand relevance or is there a relationship? I mean, should yeah. we care about that? I think we should care about it much more than most of us do as leaders. Mm-hmm. Like we're so internally focused and, and well, it's, it's weird because we're internally focused in terms of our day to day. And then we're externally focused in terms of what does the market think? Are we getting the kind of you know, customer response we want? Are we getting the kind of shareholder response we want? Mm -hmm. And employees tend to get, like, we just assume that they're bought in, but it's just, just, we take them for granted. Same bus we are, but maybe. Yeah, yeah, they're not, we release, we, the CEO gives one speech, we release like one memo, maybe there's some Uh kind of internal tour that happens about Mm -hmm. a change in strategy, but that's usually it, you know, like it's not, there isn't this constant, we, we don't recognize this constant need to persuade people that we're going in the right direction. Um, and so we just, we undervalue the the kind of depth that it takes to, to really bring people along. I, I know I was doing a presentation, I think it was in 2013 at the Lincoln Park Zoo. And one of the people in the audience was like, what do we do about our employees? They're tweeting about things that aren't really true. They're saying that they're, you know, it was like a hotel. They're like cold outside under, but we have heaters on. I'm like, you can't tell them not to tweet that. So well, are you <laughs> right. seeing any changes in social media policy or like, is there like a, one way to do it right? I mean, what are companies doing right now to guide employees on what to, to yeah. post? Or can you? Know, you? Well, you can, but you have to do it with some delicacy, obviously. Okay. Like, I would say taking aside the kind of regulatory environments you mentioned earlier, which definitely have their own nuances. Yes. Um I think that the the companies that I've seen do well recognize that employee advocacy is some of the most powerful advocacy there is. Like mm-hmm. if you're out there trying to convince 
the market that your strategy for reducing your carbon emissions, for example, is going to be effective long term, both for the financial markets, for your financial mm -hmm. performance, but also just to make people feel better about your contribution to the fight against climate change. And yet your employees are like, this is all hot air. <laughs> like I don't think that people are going to know, like connect the dots, right? Like, but right. if your employees are like, I've been on the ground doing mm -hmm. this work, there's legitimacy here. Like mm -hmm. if they can actually speak to what they're doing every day and saying like, no, we're, we're having a good faith effort to against mm -hmm. this fight. We're not there yet. We still have a lot of, a lot of ground to make up, but I trust that my leadership is doing the right thing. How powerful is that? Because it's a first person accounting of what the company is actually doing. It doesn't have all the PR spin. So right. I do think that there is the opportunity to um, engage employees, to turn them into advocates. I think it takes um, a social media policy that is flexible enough to allow that, like doesn't just try mm -hmm. to shut everything down. Mm -hmm. I think it takes some, some just like actual prompting of like, hey, it'd be really helpful if if anyone wants to share, like we just mm -hmm. released this report or we just like, you know, like actual engagement with your mm -hmm. employees with their own spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes some like level of trust on behalf of, leadership, which is tough. It's tough to get there. It is. Do you think maybe they could interview employees or bring them into the story in the corporate page? hundred percent. They should. Yeah. Okay. I think what the problem is that when, when internal teams tend to do that, I've seen, they, they cherry pick who they want to share about oh. and the rest of the employees know that, right? Like, oh yeah, that's Barbara. She always gets chosen for this kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like they, it's kind so, of like, yeah, it's like the ones that are, yeah. And I, I was doing a, a project for a steel company in Chicago and they said, oh, just interview this person. She's been there 20 years. And so, you know, cause I was working on their corporate magazine. So I call her and it turns out she was the first African-American woman hired. And all of a sudden it came, came from being a little tiny footnote to being a cover story. So you never know, there might be- That's awesome. People, yeah, you know, there could be some cover stories hiding around in there. Yeah. So, and what do you go ahead? Well, I was just going to say we tend to we we tend to listen to the loudest, most influential people first, who are mm -hmm. often the like, you know, biggest company advocates, without engaging kind of down the rest of that influence sphere. Like finding the people who are really interesting, but for the last twenty years have just shown up from nine to five and haven't really spoken out. You know, like there, mm -hmm. there's if we think about influence as a chart of like the people at the top are the the most vocal. Mm -hmm. And the ones that everyone listens to and the people at the bottom are just kind of the followers. Like there's interesting stories at all levels of that, but we have to dig for them and really engage our employees on, you know, where they're at. Yeah. That's kind of the fun though. You never know what you're getting. It is. For. Yeah. Totally. totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, so we've talked about corporate employees. What do you think companies should do? Should they stand back or let things like blow through the wind? We just had this whole issue with someone in Adidas. And uh -huh. uh, this morning we found out that contract is over. So um, what, what's your thought on that? Should, I mean, does it, should a brand jump in or should they not react? I mean, <laughs> do you have any ideas? I'm laughing because like to some degree, that's like a crisis comms question yeah. that we've been asking for the past like 10 years based on like the very first social media blowback, you know? Um, yeah. So there's, we've been negotiating social media crisis comms for a, a long time. I think the, what has changed in the last few years is there's more of an expectation mm -hmm. that a company is going to not just be defensive, like not just mm -hmm. have a reactionary position, but to be on the offense, talking proactively about what they believe, what they care about, where their values are. Um, and that sometimes that means making hard decisions like Adidas did about cutting, you know, long-term relationships. Um, and sometimes uh, I, I think the hard thing about planning for those kinds of situations, and this is something we've thought about as a firm a lot, just with our political background is there's, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a, what's the, what's the an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of like de defense, Something um, like that. It's supposed yeah. to be sure, but I'll go with defense. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember exactly how the phrase goes. Um, <laughs> it takes, there's an opportunity cost to getting caught off guard with, um, oh, for sure. you know, right. And, but, but most people yeah. don't want to spend time 
planning and like saying, what's our workflow when mm -hmm. something like this mm -hmm. happens? And so we've been trying to put together some IP around just like, how do we, how do we manage a crisis like that when it comes out of nowhere based on the values we've already said that we have and we want to maintain publicly? Um, and there's, yeah. there's, you know, again, some of that's based in crisis comms, you know, mm -hmm. best practices that have been around forever. And some of it is very unique to the kind of internet driven reality that we have now. So are you like an on-call crisis prevention or interaction? <laughs> Tell us what you do at 18 Coffees. No, I, I, I know you I do mean, more than that, but <laughs> we've definitely had clients that have treated us like that, but it's not really what we tend to do. We, we, we do a lot of work in strategy. And so mm -hmm. when like to give the example we were just talking about, like uh, clients call us when they, when this has happened to them over and over mm -hmm. and they're like, we want to stop getting caught off guard. We want to actually think through this intentionally. And then we'll come mm -hmm. in and actually work through them, work, work with them through a, you know, calm strategy that, that is you know, both based in principle and can be reactive at specific moments that that doesn't cause the blood pressure of the organization to rise because we've already planned for it, right? Right. Um, and so, you know, that that's really what we help do is put together that kind of strategy and infrastructure in place. It's mm -hmm. why we talk about change management so much and why I wrote about it in the book. Like we're we're interested in in transformation. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the work we do is at at the intersection of technology and social impact as it relates to mm -hmm. transformation for businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what our background is. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we come in and help, help orgs transform and really honestly, like help leaders do what they want to do well anyway. Right. Like we just, we're, we're a little bit more, give a little bit more resources to do that. That's great. And do you have specific industries you like to work with? You know, we're much more interested, I think, in the problems that we're trying to solve than the industries because mm -hmm. we've worked across. I mean, we've done B B two B and B two C. We've done a lot of nonprofit work. Um, we've done we've done a little bit of everything, to be honest. I think it's just we tend to go where the the best problems are that we can help solve. So things things related to um, social disruption and digital disruption, things that are about like the future of work in a lot of ways, things that are about, you know, how do we, how do we activate this diversity, equity, and inclusion policy? How, do we have an ESG strategy? Um, you know, we've tried to implement this tech solution, but it's failing. Like no one wants to adopt it. Like how do we get people to adopt it? You know, it's a lot about, we, we have these specific moments in time as businesses where we have big decisions to make. We have big, we need people to work differently. How do we get them mm -hmm. to work differently? Wow, that's important work. Yeah, I mean, we think so. It's it's really fun. It's messy. Um, you know, what's what's crazy about it, honestly, is that feelings can get hurt. Like people are we we mm -hmm. we tend to come in when somebody's baby's been called ugly, and we have to be like, no, we actually like we need everyone needs to get excited about this new opportunity, not you know necessarily like because we spend time grieving the old way of working, but we need to actually change our mindset, start looking toward the future a little bit. Yeah. And uh, back to what you said, all leadership has changed leadership and That's we right. are changing every day. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I just feel like we're just continually evolving, which sounds kind of cliche, but it, it just seems like we're in that world right now. You just don't know what the day is going to bring. And, That's right. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, if you think about it from the standpoint of history, like we have been given this incredible like power overnight mm -hmm. right like uh, the iphone is what 15 years old now like we've been yeah. we now carry around this amazing supercomputer of with access to the world's information and access to you know global communications mm -hmm. like it's like it's no big deal <laughs> like, we just it, take it for granted we do and and yeah. <laughs> I, I always say like it's we haven't had our with great power comes great responsibility moment. Like we just don't, we don't know what to do with all this power. And mentally we're overloaded by, you know, all this access to the world's information. So we're in this like transitory period of um, being connected to everything. And it's, it's fascinating, but it's hard. So when is that moment going to come? What do you think that will be? The moment where we get used to it? Well, or the moment where you said with great power comes great responsibility. That sounds like a superhero movie. So. Yeah, well, it's, it's from yeah. Spider-Man, <laughs> which I'm a huge fan of. Um, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. It's hard to predict. I mean, we're kind of, 
And I, I think if I was to zoom out, you know, about human history mm -hmm. and looked at this like as a tiny little part of it, we're kind of in that transition moment now, I think, where mm -hmm. it's like, I, I'm hopeful that some of the transition to Web3 will will think about that. Like some of the people I know working at the forefront of Web3 are some of the most creative, socially responsible, interesting people that I know who are trying to create mm -hmm. a better web than, than Web2 turned out to be, right? Where it turned out to be a little more exploitative, a little more focused on uh, capitalism and eyeballs and engagement than a lot of us at the beginning of it, you know, thought that it was going to free us up to be connected to all of humanity, you know, and then it ends up being controlled by like four companies. So well, like, that's it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like the the people that are working on Web3, I think are are, are trying to make Web3. I'm, I'm skeptical mm -hmm. of some of the efforts, but but some of them are trying to make Web3 more democratic, more decentralized, more more beneficial to everyone. Mm -hmm. So who knows, we could be at the cusp of a big moment, you know, where we're, where we're going to transition into something like that. But I think either way, now that we're reconciling in the last few years, the impacts of the internet on society, hopefully we will come out of this trans transition period with something that is a little more stable. Yeah, we can only hope. Yeah. Yeah, we can only hope. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the future is not determined. We determine it. That's it. So we have to be part of the solution. Well, yeah. And um, as you see in your book, whether we realize it or not, our experiences with change actually change us. That's right. So, you know, we're changing all the time. And uh, I think that's really a great place to kind of wrap this up. And I would like to ask you, where can people find 18 coffees and also tell us how did you come up with the name 18 coffees because I wanted to tell you I did a google search for news on 18 coffees there are so many stories about people who ordered 18 coffees I'm like, I know I get like the some, google alerts something, you know I don't know <laughs> I, uh, I get the google alerts it's very funny um yeah <laughs> no um we so we we were trying to come up with a name for a company from me and my business partner Robin and we if you've ever named anything important, like a company or children, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what the naming, like, it just feels oh. like got a copywriter friend that says the, the fewer words, the more important they become. And so that they, so it gets harder to write mm -hmm. shorter copies. Mm -hmm. So when you're naming something, you, we ended up hating everything. Like some of it was, we were like, Oh, we do more creative or we do, should we use our last name? You know, just mm -hmm. couldn't settle on anything. So finally over chat one day, I was like, it doesn't matter. We just need a website that's free and that people can find. Like we can, mm -hmm. we can build mm -hmm. equity in whatever name we choose. We just need to choose something. So you just give me a number and I'm going to give you a flavor of ice cream. If the website is free, we are going to pick it and we're not going to look back. We're just going to name our company that. And she's Chinese. So it's a, 18 is a lucky number. Yeah. Um, I was on a coffee ice cream binge at the time. I really love coffee ice cream still. And we were like, fine, that's it. Neither of us hate it. Like done need to stop we just need to be through with this process so that's the well I love it the history yeah <laughs> really cool and, and where we are at find you yeah we are at 18coffees.com and and at 18 coffees around the web and if you want to find me I'm at calebgardner.com and pretty much uh at Caleb Gardner wherever you're wherever you're looking okay and when I close the podcast I always ask my guests what is their word of the day so what's your word of the Ooh. day What's my word of the day? I'm going to say resilience. That's after uh, biking my kid through the rain to get to school this morning and then and then coming back and jumping on a podcast. Like I think that I'm uh, appreciating the res resilience and, and just pushing through things this morning. Wow, that's a great one. A lot of determination and resilience there. And yeah. uh, for everyone who's interested in buying the book, I would highly recommend it. It's no point B. Rules for Leading Change and the New Hyperconnected Radically Conscious Economy by Caleb Gardner. This is your guide to what's coming up and how to really live the life of a change leader, no matter who you are in your organization, but especially internal communications. And uh, any last tips or ideas or words you want to leave us with, Caleb? Um, just that, uh, as we were mentioning earlier, it's all of our responsibility to create the kind of world we want to see. I, I believe that disruption is inevitable, but the kind of disruption we get isn't. We, you know, it's up to us. Wow. 
Well, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Barbara Rosconi, the host of Growing Social Now, sponsored by Corey West Media, that you can listen to wherever you like. And our guest today, thank you again, is Caleb Gardner, the founder of 18 Coffees.